And as we're beginning this morning, I want to welcome all of those who are watching via uh, the media and to our church service here at Orchard Assembly. Um, we would trust that someday you would bless us with your presence. It would be very great to get a chance to meet you in person. And so we invite you to come be a part of the, the congregation here uh, at Orchard Assembly. I, I'm going to be, uh, this morning, I'm going to take you to the book of Acts, uh, to the ninth chapter. The title of my message this morning is Divine Encounters. I believe that the church needs today a divine encounter. Our world is filled with all kinds of encounters. If you've been to the gas station to get fuel, you have been encountered with an increase in price. Uh, others have been had an encounter with discouragement or disappointment. Some have had a, 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 an encounter with a medical issue or problem, and others inflation, some uh, with demonic, and even the point of death. It has been too long since we were in a church service where we trembled at the presence of God or were even astonished at his work in us because of the lack of, dem of divine encounters, the church is experiencing all the forms of idolatry, malice, a lack of influence in our society, to the point that the government is exerting their power over the church. The lack of divine encounters has allowed true Christianity to be attacked, and therefore we are not carried a pure morality to the world. So in some cases, the church has become an offense and a stumbling block. I say, let's change that. I want you to read with me from Acts chapter 9. I'm beginning at verse number 1, and I will ask you again this morning if you will stand for the reading of the word. I think this is just an honor point for us to stand and read the word together. It says, then, then Saul still breathing threats, and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now I want to insert here just something. Saul went and got permission to get letters to arrest Christians who were in Damascus. He went after the church, the people in the church. But when Jesus steps on the scene, Jesus says to him, Why are you persecuting me? When you touch God's church, you are also touching God. And Jesus is making that very plain here. You are persecuting me, not just the church. All right, let me read on. It is hard for you to kick against the gourds. Verse 6. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. The emblem of the gospel is a light from heaven. We, the church, need a divine encounter with the light from heaven. The gospel is a special revelation. It's an encounter with God's will. And notice this. It was suddenly that there was a divine encounter with Saul. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, I ask for the anointing to preach the word. I ask, Father, for the anointing to receive the word. Lord, I pray that even while we're speaking this morning, that there will become a hunger in our hearts and in our lives for a divine encounter with you. 
So, Lord, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit will begin to work in each of our hearts, our lives, our mind, our soul, our spirit. Let it be so now, Father, that we would receive the truth of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And you may be seated, and thank you again for, for standing. As I mentioned, I'm entitling my message this morning, Divine Encounters. Moses had a divine encounter with a burning bush. He thought he had had his life all in order. He thought, okay, this is the way my life is going to be. Here's what I am, and here's what I'll always be until I die. And one day he's walking around, and a bush gets set on fire, and he stops, and he hears a voice from that, that saying, I want you to go and lead my people out of Egypt. I'd say that was a divine encounter. Moses has a divine encounter with that burning bush. He had to have a divine encounter before he could challenge Pharaoh. Each plague that happened was a divine encounter with God's God's power. And notice something, that it took ten of those plagues for God to fulfill the promise of the children of Israel being set free. I say to you this morning that God wants to set free people free. Elijah. I love the story of Elijah. The people in in, in Israel were worshiping this God and this God and this God and this God and and they were just scattered all over the place and who they were worshiping. And namely it was the name Baal was what came up and there was over 400 prophets of Baal that they were that were leading people astray and Elijah steps into the situation and Elijah says wait a minute here we're following the wrong God we've got to get back to the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and so he he challenges the the the, the prophets of Baal and they come and you know the story but they build this altar and they put their sacrifice on it and then they begin to call out to their God to come and send fire because Elijah had said that the God who answers by fire is the God whom we're going to worship and so they build this altar and they put their sacrifice on and they 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 they, they cried and they screamed and they hollered and they prayed and they did everything they could but nothing happened there was nothing happening and finally Elijah says you know maybe Baal went on vacation maybe he's on a cruise somewhere in the Mediterranean we don't know where he went maybe maybe he's sick today and he can't answer his phone but whatever it is And boy, they cut themselves, they hollered all the louder, they got crazier about the whole thing, and nothing happened. Finally, he says, okay, enough of that. He builds his altar, and he puts the sacrifice on it. But he says, wait a minute, whoa, 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 let's let's douse that with some water. And they came, and they dumped buckets of water on that thing until the sacrifice on the altar and the ground around was saturated with water. (laughs) And then he said, okay, God, it's your turn. And God sent fire. (laughs) The fire of God was a divine encounter with God's power. To experience a divine power, we have to lay our life on the altar to sacrifice. we got to be soaked in the the water of the word so that the fire of God can burn up the idols of worship in our life. And after God sent the fire, unfortunately there was only a brief revival in the land. I believe this, that God wants to send revival to America. I believe that God wants to send revival to Orchard Assembly. And notice this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. See, God wants to restore the church back to its relationship and its fellowship with himself. I spoke a few weeks ago when we were here, and uh, and I told you about the fact that David, he didn't just challenge Goliath, he killed Goliath. Goliath had a divine encounter with God's power. Boom, he was dead. 
It was a sudden attack. He never even saw the stone coming. He never realized that it was going to be the end of his life that day when he laughed at David and when he invited David to come closer. He had no idea. I'm going to tell you this morning that God's power will cause you to get knocked down. Didn't Saul, in our text this morning, fall to the ground? Mm Mm-hmm. You see, dropping to our knees is a sign of surrender. After David defeat, or kills Goliath, the army of Israel chased the Philistines away. And God wants us to kill the giants who are the enemies of our soul. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, another famous story. They were challenged by the king. Everybody must bow down. Everybody must bow down to me. Everybody must bow down to my stature. Everybody must bow bow down to my image. But the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we serve the one true and living God, and we will not bow down to a man for any reason. They had a divine encounter with God's power. Oh, yeah, they, they ended up in the fiery furnace you, you, you read the story. You know the truth. They ended up in that fiery furnace. But what we learned is that they were walking around inside that fiery furnace. They weren't just standing there and trembling. They were walking around. I, I happen to believe, because you'll learn in time, I got a great ma- imagination. And I believe they were just, hey, praise the name of the Lord who is our God. Hallelujah. Welcome to the fire, Lord. Welcome to the fire. When's the last time you've been in the fire of something? And you said, Lord, welcome. I'm so glad you're here with me. See, so often we're just, God, you got to get me out of this. God, you got to get me out of this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we can stay here all day. Why? Because Christ is here. They had an encounter, a divine encounter with God's power. And you know what happened after they got out of the fire? God's name was exalted. We have been in a fire, but we're going to come out of it, even not even smelling of smoke. And God's name will be exalted so that all men will be drawn to him. As the scripture says, as he is lifted up, all men will be drawn unto him. Each of these accounts is a confirmation. It is a result that God won. God is always going to win. He does not know defeat. He is always going to win. Now, Jesus used his anointing for four reasons. First of all, to reveal the purpose of his ministry. Do you know your purpose for your place of ministry? Tonight, I'm going to speak a little bit more about that, so I invite you back. Six o'clock, we'll be here together, and we'd love to have you come back and join us for this evening. Number two, to perform, he, 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 Jesus used his anointing to perform his ministry. For too long, we have needed the power of the Holy Spirit to perform our duties in ministry. Number three, to teach his disciples. We need to discover the actual disciples of Jesus in our church family and train them in ministry. Our children and youth ministries are not secondary ministries. They are priority ministries if we're going to train the next generation to carry the gospel to the rest of the world. When I was actually 9 and 10 years old, the pastor of our church used to call me up and he'd say in the summertime when I was off school and he'd say, hey, you want to go with me? I'd say, sure, because he usually bought me lunch. <laughs> but we, I would go with him and we went, we went sometimes hospital visitation and sometimes we, we went to go visit somebody that was shut in in their home and he allowed me to go with him. He, he mentored me about that. And at that particular time, he didn't know that there was going to be 20 or 30 years that was going to pass, but someday I would be his associate pastor and we would work together. But he mentored me. And number four, to transfer his anointing to his disciples. We are to mentor, to pass our anointing to those that God gives us. I have already, in my short little life, got the privilege of a lifetime. I got to preach the funeral of my mentor. His family asked me, would you, would you do his funeral? And I was honored to do so. And after, after the funeral was over, his children came to me 
And they said, all these years we've wondered who his mantle fell on. And we realize today his mantle fell on you. Hmm. God wants you to take your mantle and pass it on to someone else. Now I want to take this just a little bit deeper. Jesus used his anointing to reveal the purpose of his ministry. Jesus' work had one objective, and that was to destroy the works of the devil. We are called to do the same work. It's time for the church to have a divine encounter with Christ that will cause us to be bold instead of wimpy and limpy. We have let the devil push the church around. We've let the government church push the church around. It's time for the church to have a divine encounter with God and to stand our ground and say, no, this is the, the word of God to the world. purpose of our church's ministries is to destroy the works of the devil. We don't have a, a, this is a great, gorgeous building, and it's got all kinds of possibilities, but they didn't build this building just so that we could come on Sunday mornings and sit in chairs and then go home the same way we came. This was built so that there would be a time, an opportunity in everybody's week to come and have a divine encounter with God that would change our lives and destroy the works of the devil. Now, there are two important elements of, de of destroying the devil's work. Number one is knowing our purpose. What's the reason for our church's existence? Why was it established? What do we hope it will accomplish? You see, here's the bottom line, church. We are in the redemption business only. Everything we do should be done with redemptive purpose. I have mentioned that, I, that I, my mission statement is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations. Now, I know that's a borrowed vision. I know that's a borrowed mission. But I believe it came from a really good person. And I don't think that Christ changed his mind 2,000 years later and said, oh, what you need to do is come up with a new vision. No, we need to get back to the vision that he gave us to begin with, which was to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Hallelujah. You see, I believe that's God's vision statement, so it is our purpose. And our purpose is to connect people to Christ to connect them to the cross, to, to connect them to the, to, to the, to the, to the covenant. Well, I, I believe that, that we should be connecting people to the Word of God. I think we need to be connecting people to the Holy Spirit, and I think we need to be connecting people to the local church. We accomplish that by helping people belong to the great commandment. The great commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's where we want to be, get to, all right? And as we get there, when others come in, guess what? They'll follow that suit, and they'll fall in the, love with the same God you're falling in love with. We also want to let them come to the place of believing in the Great Commission, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we want to help people become great partners with Christ. See, we never go into ministry alone. You're not standing alone. Now, this morning, you see me just standing here, but I guarantee you, no, you cannot see Christ. He is standing here with me. He's holding my hand. If he didn't, I wouldn't stand up here. I'd get off this platform so fast. But I know he's with me. He has proved over and over and over. He has been so faithful to me. Go, go with me to Isaiah 61. T just take your Bibles for a moment. Turn over to Isaiah 61. I just want to show you something here. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Let me ask you a question this morning. What is your testimony. See, our testimony is not that we have been to church since we were a baby. 
Our testimony is the Spirit of the Lord God is upon us because the Lord has anointed us. You can just say amen. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but that anointing will not come without a divine encounter with the Christ who brings it. Now, let me read on. To preach the good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to counsel those who, who or console those who, who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the Spirit of heaven, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Hmm. These verses cause us to discover the plan, the purpose, and the path, and the pattern for ministry. The plan is that we would have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Did Jesus not say to his disciples, do not leave the city of Jerusalem, do not go out and minister until you have received the promise of the Father? And what was the promise of the Father? The person of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the plan is to have the, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> The, the purpose is to have to preach the good news of Christ and his gospel. The path is to liberate those who are bound by sin and habits and addictions and hurts. And the pattern is to heal by recovering sight to the blind and, and bind up the brokenhearted physically, emotionally, and spiritually. To proclaim comfort to all who mourn and to give a crown of beauty and to give oil of gladness and to put on the garment of praise. Jesus mentioned or mentored a twofold ministry. One, the preaching, the declaring of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come. It's here. Let's receive it. The kingdom of God is here. Let's receive it. And the other was this, healing, was a demonstration of the kingdom of God. That's why you're going to, to learn, as you see here, that I'm going to take time in our services, Sunday morning and Sunday night, to pray for people personally around the altars. Because I believe that if you came here and you're not feeling well, you came here and you got a sickness, you came here and you got some disease, you got, you got some trouble, you got some situation, tribulation, whatever you're going through, that, man, I believe that there's a God who's in this building and that God can heal that and you can go home well. That's my belief. Whether anybody else in the building believes or not doesn't make any difference to me because I believe it. Because I know that God is here. He's everywhere. Let's have a divine encounter with him. Jesus is referred to in the New Testament, and the kingdom was declared and is discovered in the person of Christ Jesus. Number one, he is the advocate. Jesus pleads for us in heaven before the Father. I believe the Bible would say it this way. He ever lives to intercede for us. We have someone in which we can bring our trials, our troubles, our failures, our, our lack of whatever. We can bring it to him, and he acts as our attorney with the Father. We have one who, when you don't know which way to go, will counsel us. We have one who thoroughly is invested and committed to our, our cause and our case. Again, the Bible says there is only one advocate, one mediator between God and man, and it is the man, Christ Jesus. Christ qualifies to be the advocate because he knows the ways of heaven. And he qualifies to be the advocate because he satisfies the law of heaven by his death. And he qualifies to be the advocate because he is the prevailing power, authority with the judge of the earth. And he, is, he qualifies to be the advocate because he's been risen from the dead. Christ is alive this morning. He's alive. I don't know if you caught it. He's alive. <laughs> he is not dead. I've been to Israel. 
The cross in Israel is empty. The tomb in Israel is empty. And I guarantee you this morning, whether they showed me the right cross or the right, the right tomb, what I believe this morning is that tomb wherever it was and that cross wherever it was, I guarantee you this morning it is empty. But the seat that sitted right next to the Father is full of the presence and the power of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is also referred to in the New Testament as the Almighty. He has sustaining resources. There is nothing impossible with God. Don't ever shout me down at the same time. There is nothing impossible with God. He is full of hope. He is full of strength. He is full of consolation. He has resources and power to redeem. I want to make this declaration to you this morning. His blood has never lost its power. The power of the cross is still available to all who are in need. And the Bible declares that he is right to judge. To top it off off that list, he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above what all you could ask or even think. What a God. God is also referred to in the New Testament as the Alpha and the Omega. As Alpha, he is the beginning of all things as well as the end of all things. As, as Alpha, he, is, he was the first to be raised from the dead. But one of these days, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, he's going to raise all of the dead to be with him. Hmm. As the Alpha, he is the source of all truth, life, and the way. As the Alpha, he is the spring of living water from which the river of grace and mercy flow. As the Omega, he is the glory of the end. We we find strength to endure to the end in him. He can furnish and finish whatever he began. Understand this this morning. No matter how crazy the world may get, no matter how foolish some people may act that are in places of leadership in our nation, God is still in control. (laughs) Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. Christ is also referred to in the New Testament as the Amen. He is the faithful and the true witness. He is the one through whom the plan, the purpose, the path, and the pattern of God is established. The, The word Amen, was used by the Israelites to indicate their agreement with the law or submission to the law. It was the word used to indicate, we say so too. The word amen today means it's fixed, it's true, it's unchangeable, it is established. And I want to declare to you this morning... This book is fixed. It does not change. This book is true. This book is unchangeable. And this book is the establishment of the church. It's our foundation. You're not going to be judged by anything but the book. When the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment, that judgment is going to be about one thing, how you measure up to this book, not how do you measure up to the preacher, not how you measure up to the board, not how you measure up to your society. Did you measure up to the book? Hmm. Christ is also referred to as the anointed one, God's only begotten son. You know, the, the Hebrew word for Messiah is the anointed one. He is referred to in the Old Testament as the one who would redeem them. He is the light to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. Christ is prophet, priest, and king. Jesus declared he was sent by God. Christ was sent directly from the Father. You and I have been sent by God to proclaim Christ as the advocate, the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the Amen, the Anointed One, to our place of ministry. Jesus also provided for us mentoring examples of ministry. 
his wilderness temptations. He went away for 40 days to receive the anointing, the unction, and the authority of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says this, that when he came out of the wilderness, he was full of the Holy Spirit power, full of anointing. He was full of the unction. He was full of the authority of the Holy Spirit. See, we defeat the enemy of our soul before we are able to to help others defeat the enemy of their soul. And we must be confronted and convicted by our own sin, our own iniquity, our own rebellion, our own transgression, our own pride, and our own lust, etc., etc., before we're able to help somebody else get there. See, you got to get all that stuff under the blood. You got to get it under the blood. You got to get it under the blood and let it wash away. See, that's where the freedom is when it's washed away. When it's washed away, it's under the blood. And when I was growing up as a kid, I, 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 the only thing our, our family really did is go to church. That's it. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and any other time the church building was open, that's what we did. We just went to church. And I thought the world was having so much fun. I thought, man, everybody's having fun but me. All I get to do is go to church. So I joined the military. Hmm. And one night I'm sitting in a USO club in a long city of the Philippines. It's on a Sunday night. USO Club is nothing more than a bar. And I watched. All the guys I had went over on the beach with that night, they were all up dancing with these girls that the military and the government provide. This girl came and sat down beside me. She said, hey, I love you. No kidding, sailor. You buy me a drink? I said, no. I have no intention of buying you a drink. She sat there for a few more minutes, and she said, No kidding, sailor, I love you, you buy me a drink. I said, no, ma'am, I'm not buying you a drink, you need to move on. She sat there a little longer and she said, no kidding, sailor, I love you, you buy me a drink. I said, no, ma'am, I'm not going to buy you a drink, and if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to go get a couple SPs to help usher you out. She got up and called me some names I know my mother never intended me to be called. (laughs) But I was sitting there on that Sunday night, And I said, you know what, Lord? There's a whole church back in South St. Paul, Minnesota, who's praying I come home alive from Vietnam. And I got up and I walked out of that bar and I said, Lord, tonight I give you my life. And I experience that freedom and liberty that I've been looking for. See, when you're having a divine encounter with God, church isn't boring anymore. It's not boring when you, when you meet him and he meets you and there's that freedom and that liberty that comes into your life to serve him. Whew. Oh, how about, talk about being set free. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. But it's got to get washed away. That night, walking around on that island, on that beach, I gave my life to Christ and he washed it all away. Hmm. You see, our victory through the blood of Christ over the enemy of our soul will bring fear upon the devil and his demons. The first miracle recorded in the book of Mark, Jesus was in the synagogue and people were amazed at his teaching. They, they said, how could it possibly be? Listen to this man speak. This is different than what any of the Pharisees have ever been teaching us or taught. It's with authority. It's with power. It's with might. And they were so, they were so ecstatic. His doctrine even was new to them, and yet they knew that it was true. See, in our society, when we go out and present the gospel to, his, to people, it's new to them and with the anointing they will feel that it's true a man in that enters that synagogue who was demon possessed and the demons responded to Jesus's presence what do you want with us was their cry have you come to destroy us Jesus said shut up 
Now, I don't know which version of the Bible has that, but mine says, be quiet. <laughs> Come out. An evil spirit shook the man, but he came out. Demons nor the devil have any power over Christ's presence. You can, if you read through the, the Gospels, any time Jesus came in confrontation with the demons, the demons never said, okay, there's a thousand of us, let's take this boy on. They always backed up. Whoa, what are you going to do to us? They never said, what are we going to do to him? Demons and the devil understand Christ better than the church world does today. See, that's why our ministries, in our ministries, we don't want to give the devil a foothold. Therefore, we need the indwelling of Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' authority is not based upon the fact that he was in charge or some crafty idea or popular regard, but upon the righteousness, holiness, and purity of himself. The main characteristic of Christ's public ministry was his authority, and it came from his righteousness, his holiness, and his purity. For our testimony, witness to be effective, we must come from the heart and life of someone who is righteous, holy, and pure. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus has an encounter with a young man who was demon-possessed. The demons uh, of the devil were always trembling in the presence of Jesus because there ain't no power on earth, under the earth or above the earth, that could keep him in the grave. In actuality, the demons were begging Jesus, please leave us alone. Today, men and women break their moral and social restraints. They act in reckless and, uh, ways and destroy their lives. They suffer disgrace and loss of self-respect and break up their, their homes. Their human passions and selfishness only expose the darkness of their heart, not realizing that letting in a little sin will open up the door of their heart for the whole legion of sin and demons. So what I'm saying to you this morning is Jesus is our defense. The demons will never be afraid of me, but they are afraid of the Jesus who is in me. Jesus, they're never afraid of you. They're not afraid to get in your face. They're not afraid to attack you. They're not afraid to come at you at any way they want, except till they see that Jesus in you. Ooh. Hmm. You see, he is the one who restores and equips us with joy and gladness. He's the one who reconciles us back into relationship and fellowship with God. Our fellowship with Christ and the Holy Spirit can never be passive because all the hosts of hell are against it. If there's any one thing that hell is against, it is the fellowship with Christ and the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of the people of Christ. Because the enemy of our soul doesn't want us to have fellowship to the one who regenerates a broken heart and soul. See, when people have no hope of recovery, present Christ to them. Listen to me, and I, I, I know that you don't know me just yet, but all the psychology in the world is never going to fix people. But Christ can fix everyone. Do you believe that this morning, church? Do you believe that? Come on, the devil needs to hear you say amen to something. Huh? Amen. We, 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 we've read all kinds of books instead of, the book. We, we, we've tried to give people this thing, you know, and that thing. Listen, when you're, when you're in depression so deep you can't see the bottom, you need something a lot more than just some psychological thing that says, you know, if you'll just say that you're all right, you're all right. No, you need the power of the word of the living God to come into your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. But I guarantee you it'll set you free. See, he is able to drive out a legion of demons. 
He can clothe us in, so that we're in our right mind. And he will rescue, release, and restore them to a covenant relationship with himself. Always present Christ. In Mark's gospel, the fourth chapter, Jesus openly confronts and defeats a demonic power. A man had brought his son to the disciples to cast out the demon, and the Bible says they could not. Jesus rescues and releases. He didn't relieve the boy. He rescued and released the boy from the demons. The disciples asked him, why, why could we not deliver the boy? And Jesus replied, this, this is overcome by prayer and fasting. Prayer which is really fellowship, is a way in which Christ is ministered to us by the Holy Spirit. That fellowship is a means of imparting Christ in the believer. Prayer and fasting builds faith and confidence and reliance. There are three building blocks to faith. You don't just get faith. There are three building blocks to faith. Number one, belief. Your faith is in something you believe in. Number two, your faith is in something you trust and number three, your faith is in something you hope for. To believe, trust, and hope in Christ who can deliver and set at liberty those held in captivity. For all things are possible to him who believes. This morning, church, there is help, there is hope, and there is healing. When we bring our weaknesses and we bring our disappointments, we bring our failures, we bring our discouragements to the Savior, he does not cast us aside. He does not throw us overboard. He simply says, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hmm. <laughs> Every person is confronted with the power and the influence of the devil. That explains why some people come to church meetings on the verge of despair and hopelessness. But you will notice in Mark's gospel, the ninth chapter, that Jesus directs them to the Son himself. When people are brought to Jesus, he proceeds to correct the life, in this case of that boy. No matter what the sin, the sickness, or the sorrow, there is a grace and a mercy extended from Jesus' hand. And when he extends it, he also strengthens. Another example of Jesus mentoring is he taught them. He explained to them his mission plan to seek and to save that which was lost. He explained to them his mission purpose, to go to the cross and die for mankind and to be raised from the dead that mankind might receive eternal life. He explained to them the path of his mission, the cross that would destroy the works of the devil. He explained the pattern of his ministry, to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus often taught, not just with words, but example in doing ministry. His healings were training of examples that men let, you know, you know that story where the, the, the church was, or the house was so full of people that these guys who brought this man, they couldn't get in the door and nobody would even Part so they could bring in this crippled man. So they went up on the roof and they opened up the door and they let him down. They let him down through that roof. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. <gasps> what? Your sins are forgiven. But Jesus perceived their lack of spirituality. And he said to them, which is easier, to forgive a man's sins or to say a crippled man, get up and walk. So he says, so that you will know that I am the Son of God. Arise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately that man got up. Now, I know all the movies of Jesus, you know, they got him coming around. But the Bible says immediately he got up, took his bed, and walked home. And you know what my Bible says? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, he can do that today. He can do that today. And it doesn't make any difference how hopeless it may seem. There's a Christ who can make that happen. Oh, hallelujah. See, he, his deliverance was training in examples. He rescued and he released and he restored a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. 
In Luke chapter 9 and also in chapter 10, Jesus sends out his disciples on a training mission. When they get back, they, oh, they're excited. Man, we heal people. The demons were subject to us. And Jesus further goes into training, and he says this, Marvel not that demons are subject to you. Rather marvel at the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You're all still just sitting down. Think about this this morning. If you have given your life to Christ, your name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life. No, don't just nod your heads at me. Come on, church. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It's written down. It's written there. It's written in his blood. Hallelujah. It's time to rejoice, church. It is time to rejoice. Why? Because my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It doesn't make any difference what happened last week. Last week is just last week. But my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I know that may, doesn't, doesn't excite you, but boy, does it excite me. Jesus taught them how to deal with demonic powers. The beginning of this chapter has to do with this. He's, the disciples asked him, teach us to pray. You see, the secret to extending the place of our tent, the secret to stretching out the curtains, the secret to lengthening the cords, the secret to expanding to the right and to the left, the secret to not fearing, the secret to not being disgraced, the secret to not being or remembering the reproach is to pray. I was in this sanctuary just walking around praying. We were going to make that room back there a hospitality room. And while I was walking around in this sanctuary praying, God says, where's the prayer room in this church? I said, well, I don't know. So I started investigating. Couldn't find one. Came back in this sanctuary. God said, that room back there that you think should be a hospitality room should be a prayer room. That's why we started this morning with a prayer group back there in that room. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. See, the disciples had the conviction to pray. They were convinced they needed to pray. There was a certainty they needed to pray, and there was a confidence that they needed to pray. Prayer has to become more than a ceremony. It is, this undoubtedly sprang up out of Christ's example. Prayer softens our affection, sweetens our enjoyment, and keeps our fellowship with heaven. Prayer really implies our true spirit. Christ's teachings were so he could transfer his power, his anointing, and his, and his authority to his disciples. In, Mar in Mark chapter, 13, or chapter 3, Jesus was sending them out, and he gave them power and authority to cast out demons. They were to have a two, the same twofold ministry Jesus had. He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, cure all diseases. He sent them to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to heal all sickness. Their ministry was to declare and demonstrate God's kingdom. That is our ministry as well, church, to declare and demonstrate the kingdom of God. Also in Mark's gospel, the part of, of the Great Commission, Jesus promised that there'd be signs and wonders that would follow those we must declare and demonstrate the kingdom of God as those who first heard it. We must go forth in power of the Holy Spirit, declaring the gospel. Our message is not one of just faith. It's not one of just grace. It's not one of just mercy. Our message is the one about Jesus Christ, him coming into the world, him dying on the cross, him being resurrected, and him being ascended to the heaven. And one of these days he's coming back. I know that there are people who would say, well, you know, you've been preaching this for all of your life. You're right, I have been. And I know, well, he ain't come back yet. I understand that. But I understand this. I'm one day closer now than I was yesterday to his return. Moses overcame Pharaoh. Elijah overcame the prophets of Baal. David overcame Goliath. 
the three Hebrews overcame the fire of the king. In each of those accounts, there was a demonstration of a divine encounter with the kingdom of God. Christ performed miracles as proof of his ministry. Listen to me just this morning for a moment, just a moment longer. We serve under he who is the advocate. We serve under he who is the almighty. We serve under he who is the alpha and the omega. We serve under he who is the amen. And we serve under him who is the anointed one. May we as a church experience days of fasting and prayer that we might receive the power of faith and confidence and reliance with the purpose and the plan and the path and the pattern of ministry with Christ. The matter of receiving the anointing of Christ, the unction of the Holy Spirit, and the authority of the Father comes as we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. See, God doesn't just hand this out. And it wasn't just meant for the preacher or the pastor or the evangelist. It was meant for everybody. It was meant for everybody. But God doesn't just hand it out. It has to be sought. It has to be hungered for, for a divine encounter. The 120 that were in that upper room, we all know that story. They were there for 10 days. Why did they stay 10 days? Because there was a hunger. They sought after that gift that God was going to send them. And when he sent the promise of the Holy Spirit, you know what they received? Power. They, they received power. I wonder this morning, is there anyone here this morning who is hungry, thirsty for a divine encounter with God? Anyone? Anyone? Let me ask you this question. How long has it been since you had a divine encounter with God? It is possible that there are people in this sanctuary who have never experienced a divine encounter with God. Salvation to them has been a, a doctrine, but not an experience. The baptism of the Holy Spirit has been a theology or a doctrine, but they've never experienced it. It is possible that they have never felt the enrichment of the Holy Spirit's power in their life. Would we even be honest enough this morning to say we need a divine encounter once again? Hmm. I think what we don't really truly understand is how much God longs for his people to have a desire and a hunger and a thirst for a divine encounter with him that would bring a fellowship we've not known in years. Would you please stand and, and Marie, if you'll come back. And I know I, I know I preached hard at you this morning. I know that. But if we don't have a divine encounter with God, the devil will continue to destroy this church and any other church. Our only hope is a divine encounter with Christ. That's it. There is no other hope outside of Christ. What will be your testimony of today? Will it be, well, yeah, yesterday I went to church? Or will it be, yesterday I had a divine encounter with Christ? What will be your testimony tomorrow?